Good morning again, everyone. My name is Angeline Valentine, and I help to oversee the Belize Marine Fund, which is one of the five Marfund programs. Welcome to the fourth presentation in the Marfund hosted webinar series of our partners. While we continue to share the good work that they have been doing and the findings of their projects, the lessons learned, and other areas of collaboration. The body of work being presented today was supported by both Marfon and the Summit Foundation through separate projects. Those connected via Zoom, we invite you to share your questions and your comments for the presenter in the chat. But before doing so, we invite you to please share your name, the organization you're representing, and your country of location in the chat. We note that the webinar is being recorded and that there is simultaneous translation, which you can access using the instructions on the screen. We have just about 40 minutes for today's presentation. While the presenter is making the presentation, for those connected via Zoom, we ask that you place your questions and comments in the chat box, as I mentioned before, and those will be discussed during the question and answer segment, which we have about 15 minutes for. The session is also being streamed live on Marfone's Facebook page. And so we invite our viewers on Facebook to post their comments and questions there. Before we get into the presentation, which would be made by WWF, I would just want to take a few moments to introduce Mauricio Mejer. Mauricio is responsible for the food production program at WWF, Mesoamerica. Since 2006, Mauricio has been developing and testing best practices with producer groups for citrus, sugarcane, pineapple, banana, and palm oil, while also promoting best management practices with shrimp aquaculture operations. Before joining WWF, Mauricio worked for the Belize Sugar Industry Control Board Secretariat. He started, he studied, sorry, at the National School of Agriculture in Honduras, holds a postgraduate degree in ecological agriculture from the Tropical Agriculture Research and Higher Education Center in Costa Rica, and earned an MBA from the University for International Cooperation, Mexico Campus. Marisa, we thank you for being here with us today, and I give you the floor. Thank you, Angeline. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I will do this presentation in Spanish. So please, um, I invite you to use the translation um, facilities of this Zoom uh, webinar. Um, let me share my screen. Nuevamente, buenos días a todos. Eh, gracias por estar con nosotros. Good morning to everybody again, and thank you for being here again, to being here with us for the next hour to converse and to get to know about the monitoring of agrochem agrochemicals within the Mesoamerican Reef. WWF has been monitoring the bioaccumulation of pesticides throughout the Mesoamerican Reef since 2004. The last monitoring took place this year, 2022, 
We're going to have a look at the results from the beginning up to the current day. We have had four rounds throughout this period of time. Why have we been doing this? In the year 2004, the Declaration of Palum was signed by the four countries that share the Mesoamerican coral reef, and they decided to protect this ecosystem. And during that day, during that time, a threat analysis took place regarding the health of the reef, the coral reef. So if you look at this uh, slide, you can see that the five most important threats were the effluent pollution, unsustainable fishing, climate change, and habitat destruction for because of new constructions, new developments. A threat that was close to the priorities was poor soil management. And we can connect this to the threat number one that was found at that time, which was effluent pollution. Because the poor soil management, above all in the agricultural sector, is going to contribute to this pollution that reaches the water bodies through the effluents, the runoff, the agricultural runoffs. And with this threat analysis for the, th for the health of the coral reef, WWF, in 2006 decided to implement a program to transform the agricultural and aquacultural sector in the eco region, region of the mesoamerican area <clears throat> within this program it was decided to work with some key crops of agriculture we couldn't work with all of them because of the volume area and the amount of input that is used in these production we decided to work with the oil palm sector in honduras and guatemala with sugarcane in mexico belize and honduras with the shrimp industry of belize the banana industry of Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras, and the citrus industry of Belize and Honduras, pineapple production in Honduras, and melon production in Guatemala. These commodities, as I mentioned before, are the ones that control the largest amount of volume in the agricultural volume, the, the, the greatest uh, users of agricultural users of pesticides. So in those days, in 2006, the Dolu Arai have created a model on the origin, the WRI, sorry, the created the origin of sediments and nutrients. The main watersheds were outlined and as you can see on these images on the left this is the contribution the contribution of sediments of the water per, uh, watersheds is nit nitrogen in the ulua and chamelecon watersheds are the ones that contribute more most in, during that model of 2006 followed by motawa and other basins within the region. This 2006 model compared to the updated one that was prepared under Costas Lista Smart Coasts in the region in the year 2020, 2020, 2021, two years ago, the Stanford University prepared, created a new model on the contribution of sediments towards the barrier reef. And it, as you can see, it is similar, very similar to the one presented in 2006. What changes do we see in the Motawa Basin is compared to the one of the Ulua as the two basins that contribute 
the greatest amount of sediments in the echo region and the Chamelecon watershed improved re in respect to 2006, but it continues to provide a large amount of sediments towards the reef. So why is this, why is it interesting to look at these models? What happens in the Honduran watersheds is that there's impact, there will be impact on the coral reef, reef of Mexico, Belize, as well as Honduras. It doesn't matter whether the impacts are happening in another country through the marine currents, they will be mobilizing. So this same model, Stanford model, this comparison of colors that we see in the reef, uh, coral reef we see is that sediments that come both from Honduras and Belize towards the same area of the islands and keys of Belize. So regardless of where the greatest impact uh, land impacts are, it will still be impacting the whole area of the coral reef. Taking this into account, uh, what happens in the basins of Honduras, Guatemala, Belize will have impact on the reef, is that the agricultural sector is the greatest contributor of nutrients and pesticides through the effluents. We decided in 2004 to monitor, uh, do a monitoring of bioaccumulation and, and assessment, how these pesticides and marine species are being accumulated and risking the, putting at risk the coral. In 2004, 2004 was a base year. It took place in Sapodilla Keys. In 2007-2013, there were samples that were included from Turnef and Monkey River and, and 2022 New River in Belize. In 2019, there was no monitoring assessment in Belize. In 2004, there were no monitoring in Honduras, but after 2007, Samples were taken in Barbareta, Cayos Cochino, Zulua River, Motawa River, Guatemala, Utila Island. And in 2013, the assessment were eliminated from the Chamelecon River, the, the Moteo River, Motawa River, because of the complication of scuba diving and the risk for the scuba divers. And Utila, because of budget, was also eliminated. In 2019, it is maintained in Barbareta, Cayo Cochinos, and Ulua. Chamelecon was included in 2019. So what are we sampling? A conch, coral, fish, sediment, river mouth sediment, a marine sediment. From 2007 to 2022, we included the river and the river mouth sediments and marine sediments, including coral, conch, fish, and also in 2004, many more species were included, such as mangrove oyster, seagrass, pen shell clam, cucumber, sponge, other species because it was the year where it was being determined whether there was a bioaccumulation and to have a, a larger photograph of what was happening. With these, uh, after monitoring these sites and species in 2004, samples were taken in 2004 of fishes, of coral, of conch, and were sent to two labs of the region. Baja, the, an, uh, an agricultural sanitation authority in Belize and the, in Honduras, the, the Agricultural Foundation of Agricultural Studies. 
So they had the capacities installed to be able to do an analysis of bioaccumulation of marine species tissue. What was asked? An analysis was passed for 13 agricultural agrochemicals, and we found 30, 10 of these, which were insecticides and fungicides. And the, the one that had most was 7.3 parts per million. It's a fun, fungicide. Remember that the maximum limitation of residue permitted by the European urine is of 0 0.01 per million. And these two products were at the levels that did cause alarm. And so practices had to, better practices of management had to be put into place to reduce these amounts. So what did we do as a result? There was a meeting in Honduras where the uh, reviewed by WWF, the key agricultural partners like Chiquita, Del Monte, Dole, Fives, which are the large transnational that are producing and exporting fruit from Central America. Also some chemical companies such as Dow, DuPont, Sigenta, and other stakeholders. What was the result of this meeting? There was an agreement. It was agreed that uh, there was a bioaccumulation, but the second round must be conducted to validate the findings. That the samples must be collected by an accredited lab. It was questioned that uh, the FIA and Baja, which are well-known lab laboratories, but are not accredited in Central America, and they are the ones that uh, took uh, the analysis and the second round was agreed would be from done by accredited labs and that the management the, the management the sampling and analysis will be press. so uh, the other laboratory in the united states was contracted for these analyses and the second round analysis. In 2007, there was a second round of bioaccumulation with approved protocols. And adding sediments, or the sediments were added of the main rivers. These were sent to the lab. The 2007 results yielded no trace of any of the 95 agrochemical compounds. There were there was no bioaccumulation found or sediments. The result was very promising. We felt that all the actions of 2004, 2006 were were giving good results regarding reduction of toxicity in the in the marine ecosystem. However, we decided to continue these tests to validate the results. And that's where in 2013, we conducted a third round with the same protocols of 2007. 154 samples of coral, conch, fish, and sediments were collected. 50% were sent to a lab in the United States. These samples were collected in six sites within Belize and Honduras. The lab chosen was the ADPEN laboratory, which is accredited as and it is also a reference laboratory for the EPA for the Environmental Protection Agency. There were 38 agrochemicals that were tested that are the most commonly used by agriculture in the eco region. This is where we obtained bioaccumulation results 
And these are the pesticides that were found in, two, in 2013. One of them, highlighted in yellow, tritium morph, is one that raised more concerns because it was found in most sites except the Ulua River, but it was found in Turnev, Sapodilla, Barbareta, Cayos Cochinos. It was found in conch, coral, fish, and sediments. This is, was sending us a clear message that this pesticide needs to be, there needs to be attention paid. It is bioaccumulated and with very high levels of concentration regarding the standard levels of 0 0.01. What did we do with these results? We had a meeting with Chiquita, Fais and Gol in Costa Rica and Belize, presenting them the results. And we invited the company that produces this chemical in Germany. The good news is that in this meeting, in 2014, the European Union passed a law or a mandate to eliminate this pesticide from the market. So this coincided with our findings and the decisions made by the European Union. So by 2015, this product was out of the market. This was a very good news for all of us. It is a fungicide that kills or addresses a disease in banana plantations, which is a very important industry in the region using great a great deal of pesticides and allowed for best practices and more sustainable management practices. With these results and noticing the bioaccumulation of pesticides, the a fourth round was conducted. Also using the same lab, the ADPEN lab, there were 72 sediment samples plus fish samples, coral and conch in the same sites of 20, 2007 and 2013, where there were an analysis of 30 pesticides or chemical pesticides. We found that the Ulua sites, Chamelecon, Barbareta, and Cayos Cochinos, were, there was no bioaccumulation found in tissue, only in sediment. This was a very positive news as well, because the fact that marine species did not present bioaccumulation only in sediments showed that this was by 20, 19, there are good practices that are being implemented. These results were presented to the agricultural sector to continue managing their budgets or toxicological budgets and making, uh, addressing the sediments found in marine environments. This year, the fifth round or fourth round for Belize, because it was only done in Belize, because the 2019 round was only for Honduras. The same laboratory did the sampling. The, the number of pesticides or agrochemicals was increased to 78, which are the most common in the region. What did we find? The results were found of bioaccumulation in sediments and in tissue. Not the same products of 2019 or 2013. These are new products. It is possible that the best practices are not reaching all agricultures or all farmers in the region. It is important to highlight in Belize, 
there's a pesticide highlighted in orange is a growth regulator in plants. It is the most common found in Zapodila, Turnefe, in islands, not, not found in rivers. It was found above the, the standard allowed. This is not a pesticide. It is a plant regulator, but however, it is still a chemical product. This product is not registered in Belize. So the message is, as we mentioned at the beginning, when looking at the models of some sedimentation of watersheds, is that this product is might be registered in Mexico, Guatemala, or Honduras, and through the movement of sediments through the ecoregion, it is being transported and being found in the islands of Zapodila and Ternefe. This means this model is valid. Another important topic is that this pesticide called palatrine found in Sabodila and Ternef in liver, in the fish liver, it is found in higher levels and is permitted. There is one part per, per million allowed and it is found in 1.68 and 1.02 in Ternef. What is so uh, important to notice here, it is a pesticide that is very common and found in even in stores, supermarkets to control. It's a repellent for mosquitoes and it's a bug spray. The registered names are Zuretox, Bygone, Raid, Protox and Citronella. So the important message here is to send this to the regulating entities, but all of the country regulating entities should be aware of this because it is open for sale all over the world. At least in Central America, it is. It is purchased by anybody who wants it. It is used with no control. If somebody has a phobia for a bug specific can spray half a half a bottle to it. So there is no control. So we have to find mechanisms to of educating the population in the use of domestic plagues as well. We are working with farmers in this field of best practices in the reduction of pesticides. But these results were presented in Belize this in the month of September of 2022. And the most most of the recommendations were related to a campaign for to, to the general public or an awareness campaign on the topic of domestic plagues and reduce the use of containers and uh, to and there might be very good practices in the field, but the cycle of best practices needs to be completed. There are empty bottles thrown into the water, and these residues are being sent to the ocean. So the census or the awareness campaign is one of the methods using all the different media to teach about the responsible use of these chemi chemicals and to learn about how to manage them. Not only management of the pesticide or the bug sprays, but also the management of the residue or bottles. These are some of the results from 20, 2004 to 2022. And very briefly, I'm going to share with you some of our second efforts done by WWF since the year 2021. There is 
uh, uh, monitoring uh, suspended solids, nitrates, and phosphates in river rivers of the eco region. Why are we interested in this? As well as all the work done with in relationship to pesticides, the reports of the uh, healthy reef or the healthy reef report cards show that there is an overpopulation of alg algae causing damages in the reef, affecting the reef. So the excessive loads of phosphates and nitrates are causing eutrophication. So this is causing the multiplication of algae. Some of these are toxic and they reduce the penetration of sunlight in the, mar the marine bed, reducing the amount of available oxygen in the water, as well as the affectation of fish, the death uh, of corals, and there's also uh, reduction of penetration of light, the suspended soils solids also reduce light penetration affecting eutrophication keeping in mind what we spoke about regarding the provision of sediments and nitrates through from the basins to the ecosystems we decided to work with four rivers Four watersheds, the Ulua River and the Motagua River, as we saw in the model, are the main providers of sediments. And the Belize River and Rio Hondo in Belize as well, to broaden the monitoring of the eco region. The Ulua River, we identified eight monitoring sites from the highest part of Asacualpa that we could reach to the area called Tapón de Oros near the mouth, the river mouth are being monitored. What did we find? The highest level was going to be more pristine, is cleaner and in the lowest parts, there are greater concentrations. The averages of two years of monitoring show us graphs that do not coincide with this logic, though. There are high peaks and low peaks, independent of the site. So this is not this, the, the logic maintained. There is There are different activities, there's agriculture, urban centers providing these all these nutrients to the ecosystem. In the Ulua River, regarding nitrates in water, these are in compliance with the standard. All the values are, are, are within the norm. They are under the reference standard regarding phosphates in the Ulua River, it is uh, the contrary. They are above the norm. They are, they are providing higher levels of phosphates. And these are the bad news that we don't want to look at because these phosphates are creating an impact in the health of the reef. There is data that is positive, but the majority is above the, the standard. Total suspended solids are also in the majority above the standard. And there are months of the year in particular, like the month of April, which are under the, under the regulations or standards and there's months with less amount of rain and it is this is what is expected less suspended solids nitrates in river sediments 
are in compliance, except for a few sites in the month of September in 2021 that were above the average, but they are overall in compliance. And phosphates in river sediments are also compliant. So in the river, in the Ulua, we, are, we have to pay attention to this and find a reason why these phosphates are in super present in superficial waters. The Motagua River are, is also monitored in eight different sites, different sites, starting with the highest peak of Chichicastenango and until the river mouth in near the coasts of Honduras. The behaviors also show that, show that the difference the logic is not the same. What we find in regarding nitrates is that overall they are in compliance and some a few sites are above standard. Phosphates are all above the standard. The phosphate levels are present everywhere. Suspended solids is also above the norm nitrates in sediments are also in river sediments is also above here we have an average of two years of monitoring which present the levels above standard so phosphates and sediments are above the norm this matawa river is the one that we have to pay more attention to and prioritize it to come uh, to, to to present some be best practice to see how we can uh, eliminate this excess in belize in the river belize the eight points from the arenal hamlet it is a twin hamlet that is shared with guatemala and belize is the mouth of the river Belize in the city of Belize. Uh, behavior, uh, we see better performance towards the end of the lower, uh, middle lower part of the watershed than the higher. We have some important urban centers in the higher part of the watershed that we have to pay attention to. And in the middle and lower uh, sections, we have agriculture. The good news is that all the results of the uh, Belize, the nitrates are in compliance, phosphates are in compliance, except one site in one during one month. But in general, uh, they are in suspended solids or in uh, compliance, nitrates, phosphates, and river sediments. In general, the Belize River brings us good news. The Rio Hondo, on the river, in the higher part that we can see is where the Mennonite communities of New Creek are until the middle lower section in the community called Douglas. It has a problem to monitor this because they are wetlands that are uh, um, uh, do not permit uh, access to be able to take samples. And um, the, the good news is that everything is in compliance, uh, phosphates, nit nitrates in water, suspended solids, nitrates in sediments, and phosphates in river sediments. Again, the message is to pay attention again to what the models of Smart Coast were telling us, that what is happening in the Ulua and the Motawa, what happens there will impact the reef no matter where it's happening. Up to Belize, Quintana Roo will all suffer impacts, not because the Rio Belize and Rio Hondo give us a positive image, to, that they are maintaining their concentration of suspended nutrients. They're complying with the standards. 
not because of this as a collective, as a group of stakeholders that are interested in the Mesoamerican reef system, we need to work as in a collective manner. So whether we're in Belize, if we're in Belize, let's work with our colleagues in Honduras and Guatemala to seek for the measures of mitigation of for these impacts. Likewise, we are going to concentrate efforts in the Motawa River to search for it's a very fragmenting, fragmented watershed. A lot of forests, uh, the riverside forests have been lost. And we are starting projects, pilot projects to recover this riverside forest. The riverside forest has this role of mitigating the quantities of sediments that reach the rivers. So the, my presentation is uh, up to here. Thank you very much. We're still within time so that we can have a conversation. Thank you, Mauricio, for that fantastic presentation. Quite a lot to digest and discuss. Um, at this time, we're going to open for questions. As we had mentioned before, and I believe Carla has been sharing in the chat, um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or there is a feature at the bottom of your screen under reactions where you can raise your hand and we can give you the floor. So we're open for questions now. Good morning. I will start with a comment. Mauricio, what a pleasure to see you again. Excellent presentation. I think the results that we are seeing are very important for our country. As you mentioned, the case of the rivers that were uh, being evaluated during that period of work that took place, uh, it give, uh, gives us a little bit of hope because we see that the results that were found are not alarming in comparison to the areas that were uh, designed for evaluation. So my question is, what do you think is the cause? Do you think what has impacted most regarding the agricultural sector in Belize that has influenced the change of results to produce the results that we see in the study. That, thank you very much, Luciano. A pleasure to greet you too. What a good question. So regarding the rivers, to looking at the monitoring of the Belize and Rio Hondo rivers as something positive because there is concentration of these nutrients, but they are below the limits that are permitted. If you go along the Belize River, you see that it has a river, a very extensive riverside forest. 25 or 30 meters the law is requesting, uh, we find more dense and wider areas. It's a hundreds of meters in many cases. Through the case of the zoo, there is a very good riparian forest. Also with the Ondo River, these famous areas that do not allow you to reach the river, but also are uh, helping the runoff to prevent the runoff from the sugar cane and in the upper and lower area, the grains and cattle also. So these natural barriers that we have are, the, are, are what are giving us this result of, of concentrations below the norm on the 
uh, on the opposite of what we see in the Motawa and the Urlua are more fra fragmenting um, the, uh, results where the riparian forest has disappeared and it is a free uh, zone now for the runoff to reach the water. So we have to work on this. As you who are starting with this regenerative cultural program to extend this message to the program. Don't just stay in Belize. The objective at the end is the same to protect the coral reef. We have to work in the whole area. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you for that question, Siano. We have another question in the chat. I'll go ahead and read that one. And um, just to remind our Facebook viewers that they're also free to place their comments, post, sorry, their comments or question. So we have a question from Nidia Chacon. It says, what implication is there on our health when we consume fish that has palatrine or the bug spray, being that here in Belize, we use a lot of bug spray to deter the bioaccumulation of this on our fishes. So what is the implication for health when we are consuming these um, fish products that ha have been coming, sorry, con that when we're consuming fish products that have these toxins in them, what are the implications for health, knowing that we use a lot of bug spray in country? Gracias. Gracias, Nidia. Thank um, you, Nidia. These products that we use to control the mosquitoes <clears throat> were found in San Podilla and Victor Nev. They were found in fish liver. They're above the standard, above what is permitted. What implication does it have for our health? If we consume the fish that is contaminated, it will have some implication on our health. There is information that I do not have at hand of what amount we can consume so that at short time we do not uh, have any impact. Yesterday in a workshop we had uh, in Belize or recently, uh, this is one of the questions regarding conch and fish that is being consumed and is being exported. And some of the answers during the workshop said that this product, above all the conch, goes through controls, certain controls to make sure that they do not carry higher levels of residue than what is permitted. But for the, the local consumption, uh, it has no control. So we, uh, it is important is to expand these efforts at to the regulating entities, the Ministry of Health at local level to be able to implement prevention mechanisms, including the local consumption to prevent that the population that is consuming these marine products that contain concentrations of pesticides above what is permitted. Thanks, Maurice. So we have another question. Um, this one is from Facebook. It says, is there currently a law or normative in Honduras and Belize that regulates the proper disposal of agrochemical containers? Is there a law or a normative in Honduras and Belize that currently regulates the proper disposal of agrochemical containers? No hay una ley, pero sí hay esfuerzos. There is no law, but there are efforts that are being made. There is an organization called Croc Life, que es como una organización sombría de los 
product. Oh, this is a, a, a okay, where Bayer, Bas, Magenta, etc. are. And this organization works throughout the world. For example, in Honduras, they have made alliances with local distributors to implement re recollection systems and appropriate management of these empty containers, empty pesticide containers. In Belize, these efforts have already started. It's called Prof Life with pesticide distributors to design a mechanism. The, 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 the banana sector, the private sector in Belize, it has its own policy of collection of empty containers, and then they mobilize them to Guatemala, where they are given appropriate management on, on behalf of the providers themselves. Belize has made an effort through the certification with Just Commerce to collect and manage appropriately these empty containers. There is still a lot to do. We must continue with these conversations with the Pesticide Consult Board in Belize to implement uh, more widely this program, not just the efforts in these two sectors, because this is something that uh, this is not just because it's uh, expected by a program of certification, to, but to widen this program, where the productors have a place where they can um, get rid of their or dispose correctly their empty um, containers, and that this can also be taken care of. Thanks, Maurice. So we have another question. Tenemos here. Otra on Zoom from Sherry. Um, the question states, one second. How much confidence do you have in the appropriateness of the permitted levels for protecting the reef? So how much confidence do you have in the appropriateness of the levels of um, Yes, pesticides permitted the, the limits for protecting the reef. Sí, hola, Cherry. Eh, esa es una muy buena pregunta. That is a very good question, Cherry. The problem is that we do not have local regulations. The analysis, we uh, compare them with international regulations that not necessarily will be applicable. In the case of the of the nitrate and phosphate um, amounts, we have to have had to evaluate them with a Peruvian norm because they have a specific standard for for rivers, lagoons, etc. In Central America, our standards are for industrial waters, residual waters, or waste waters, which are very different to the natural waters. And to reach this degree of acceptance of these, of that these uh, amounts of nutrients will not be affecting the health of the, of the reef, we have to escalate our programs with more science, seek our own norms that are applicable at local level, evaluate whether these norms or standards used in Peru are applicable truly to evaluate the health of a, of, of a coral system. We don't have local science that says how much is damaging for a coral and, or how much a, these pesticides can actually damage the reef. Thanks, um, Mauricio. We have a follow-up comment to the question that we had from Nidia from um, Carlos Marin. And his comment is, in the case of fish consumption, my comment is that, this was translated for me. Thanks, um, Raphael. In the case of fish consumption, my comment is that bioaccumulation is reported in the liver and not in the muscle. 
So consumption is less risky because fish liver is not normally consumed. Gracias, Carlos. Sí, buen punto. Pero igual, siempre eh, hay que estar vigilantes, ¿no? Que, que yes, tenemos... we always have to be vigilant to see this bioaccumulation in marine organism and together inv invite the regulators so they can inspect local consumption too. Thanks again, Mauricio. So I think that's it for the questions that we have in the chat and on Facebook. Um, the floor is still open if there are any additional questions or comments um, that anyone would like to add. If not, then I will say thank you once again to our presenter and to, oh, there's something. <laughs> One second. I thought I saw something from Sherry. Okay, it's a comment, sorry. Yeah, I would just want to say thank you. Sherry was saying that um, it was an excellent presentation and she has to leave for another meeting. So um, with that, I would like to say thanks to everyone for joining us again today for another in the series of Marfon webinars. Um, I ask you guys to look out for the next webinar, um, which will be hosted sometime soon. And I will also ask if you can please fill the survey, um, which Carla has just shared the link to in the chat box. This will assist us in ensuring that we strengthen our process and make the experience a better one for our participants. So again, thank you for er thank you to everyone. We see a few messages coming in. I'll just read this one from Denise before we sign off. Um, she says that the results is an affirmation for countries to focus on improving pollution management and integrating the rich to reef approach to managing. Thank you for that, Denise. So again, thank you everyone. It was great having you and we look forward to you joining us again for the next in the series of Marathon webinars. We ask that you please fill the survey and return it to us. Have a great day, guys. Bye. <laughs>